Hi there, I'm Craig and I'm here at historic Mill Creek Discovery Park just outside of Mackinac City. Now if you've been to Mill Creek before, you know that we've got a lot to offer out here. We've got several miles worth of trails through the forest, we've got our adventure tour, we've got the reconstructed sawmill over there. But today I'd like to take a walk around the site and talk maybe a little bit more about some of the other things that went on here at Mill Creek. Because there really was a lot that took place here historically. Something that's really important to remember is that Mill Creek was a center of industrial and agricultural production here in the Straits of Mackinac for about 50 years. So to get started, let's actually go take a look at the creek itself. Well, you can see I'm actually here next to the stream and it is actually flowing freely right now. We don't have it dammed up at the moment. So this maybe gives you an idea of what it may have looked like in its natural state. But you will see that it's flowing rather quickly. And that's thanks to the unique geography and geology of this part of the Straits of Mackinac. Mill Creek is the only stream in this area that has a sufficient amount of fall to power anything. And when I say fall, I just mean that it starts at a higher elevation back up there, back upstream at Dingman Marsh. That's at a higher elevation than we are right now. And it continues to fall as it goes down towards Lake Huron down that way. And so all this moving water, that means there's a lot of potential energy stored here that can turn any number of different types of machines. That's why this spot is important. That's why everything that got built here at Mill Creek was built in this spot. It's because of the stream. So let's actually go take a look at the dam and see how people tried to harness that potential energy. Well, we've moved a little bit further downstream, so we're a little bit closer to Lake Huron now. Uh, and we're actually at the site of the dam. You can see the top of it here right behind me. Uh, it's a pretty simple structure. It's a crib dam. It's just a series of wooden beams interlocked with one another. It's set very deeply into either bank on, on both sides in the upstream face. So the side of the dam that actually faces back up the creek where the water is flowing from is angled. So it is much wider at its base than it is at the top that you can see here. That makes it pretty strong. Uh, and when the water is dammed up, there would be a large mill pond here, stored water, so that stored energy. And then when people wanted to use that energy a little bit later on, all they had to do was draw water off the top of it uh, and it would flow through a sluice way over to a mill or any number of other things where it could then fall straight down rather than this just kind of gentle, gradual descent that it's making right now. That direct fall could then turn water wheels to power any number of different machines. But now that we've kind of taken a look at the stream and the dam, let's actually go over and take a look at some of the buildings and talk a little bit more about the history of what went on here at Mill Creek. Well, here at Mill Creek, we are surrounded by forest, and that is a great resource that people have been trying to figure out how to use for a really long time. As far back as the 18th century, we know that there are people coming out here to try and harvest some of those trees. Remember that there's a European community at Michelinackinac, just three miles away, beginning in 1715. Uh, and we can be pretty sure that both the French and the British were coming out to this spot to harvest some of these trees for both firewood and building material. One of the ways that we know that is actually thanks to a railroad crew that was working in this area in the 1880s. They actually uncovered a grave. Uh, and within that grave, there was an engraved plate. Uh, and the person buried there was named John Annan. He was a British soldier assigned to the 60th Regiment at Michilimackinac, and he actually died out here in 1771. He was almost certainly assigned to some sort of woodcutting detail, whether they were out here trying to gather firewood uh, or trying to gather building materials is unclear, but they were definitely coming out to this spot to try and harvest this lumber. And again, people were doing that throughout the 18th century. So again, throughout the 18th century, people are using this spot at the very least as a place to come out and cut down trees to haul somewhere else. But by the end of the 1770s, people at Michelinackinac were really starting to think about other ways that they could utilize that lumber. In 1779, Lieutenant Governor Patrick Sinclair, who is the British commander of Michilimackinac, made the decision to move the entire community from here on the mainland over to Mackinac Island. He was a little concerned about some threats to the community thanks to the American Revolution. And as he was making plans to make that move, he specifically said that there were fine prospects over on Mackinac Island for a mill. There would be a place that he could build a sawmill, he could use water power 
to convert these trees into boards and lumber so they would have a ready supply of building materials. Now, his superiors elsewhere just kind of ignored those suggestions. They told him to focus on getting the community moved and actually building the new fort over there, Fort Mackinac. And so there was never a mill built over on Mackinac Island. That meant that all of the new construction that took place over on the island, as well as all of the construction that had taken place at Michilimackinac here on the mainland, was a pretty laborious uh, process. Now, to actually get, for instance, a board to add to your floor or to put on the wall of your house or to use in a roof or something like that, you would first need to chop down a tree, drag it someplace where you could easily work on it, chop off all of the branches, and then you would actually have to start to square that log using an ax. So you'd really want to get the sides nice and straight. Uh, and then if you wanted to turn that squared log into boards, you could use a pit saw. So there would be a very large pit dug in the ground, or maybe they would have placed that log up on a trestle. But either way, there would be one person standing on top of the log, pulling on one end of a long saw, and there'd be another person either down in that pit or beneath that trestle pulling down. And so the person on top would pull up, the person on the bottom would pull down, and they would go up and down like that uh, for essentially as long as it took for, to get from one end of the log to the other. As you might imagine, that is a very labor-intensive process just to cut out a single board. But again, that's how everything was done here. All that new construction over on Mackinac Island, uh, any building materials that they needed new, so things that they didn't bring with them already from Michelin Mackinac, they would have to create in that manner because there was never a sawmill actually built over on Mackinac Island, despite what Patrick Sinclair wanted to do. The British were able to successfully move the entire fort, so the whole community, from here on the mainland over there to the island, and they had that finished by about 1781. Work on Fort Mackinac continued, uh, and it was actually still underway when the American Revolution ended in 1783. Now, for a variety of reasons, although this area technically became part of the new United States in 1783, the British didn't go anywhere. They weren't going to give this up easily, but they also weren't going to continue building Fort Mackinac. There was no sense in completing that fort if they were just going to turn it over to the Americans eventually. And so for the next several years, the British soldiers stationed over there at Fort Mackinac had to live with the fort essentially falling down around them. And that deterioration actually gives us our first reference to a mill here at Mill Creek. Because by 1793, the British commander of Fort Mackinac, a man named Captain William Doyle, was desperate. And he was writing to his superiors in Canada, telling them that he needed to make repairs to the buildings at the fort. He said that he was going to get lumber from Campbell's Mill but he had to wait until he could get the boats ready to go and fetch that lumber. Now that tells us a couple of things. The, the use of boats to get that lumber indicates that that mill is not on Mackinac Island. It means that they had to come over to the mainland here to Mill Creek. It also tells us who owns that mill, a man named Robert Campbell. Now, we unfortunately don't know a whole lot about Campbell personally. Uh, he was living at Michelin Mackinac by 1780. He made the move over to the island with everyone else. And to compensate him for making that move, Sinclair gave him and a few other people land grants over on Mackinac Island. Now, we're unsure also when he came back over here and set up a mill, maybe sometime in the 1780s or sometime in the early 1790s. But again, by 1793, there is a sawmill at this spot run by Robert Campbell. And Doyle and other British commanders over on Mackinac Island start to turn to Campbell's mill as a source of sawn lumber. So they don't have to use that very labor intensive pit sawing process anymore. Now, again, I mentioned that the British remained over at Fort Mackinac for several more years after the revolution ended. They actually stayed for 13 years after the revolution was over. So it's not until September 1st, 1796, that American troops come up here into northern Michigan and actually took control of Fort Mackinac and made this truly part of the United States. Now, when those first American troops got there, they also found that despite whatever repairs Doyle had been making, Fort Mackinac was still a bit of a mess. And so in 1797, their first full summer over on the island, those American soldiers really went to work and they too turned to Robert Campbell's mill here at Mill Creek as a source of raw materials. 
through 1797, 1798, when the Americans are really trying to repair Fort Mackinac, when they're building new structures, including blockhouses and a few other things, they're getting that lumber from here at Mill Creek. They're buying it from Robert Campbell. So it's tens of thousands of feet of boards. It's tens of thousands of shingles. Again, all being milled here in a sawmill, just like this one, and then floated or shipped over to Mackinac Island, where it could be used at Fort Mackinac. Now again, we unfortunately don't know a whole lot about Robert Campbell himself, but when our archeologists were excavating out here in the 1970s into the 1980s, they uncovered a house out here right next to the mill that they surmise actually belonged to Robert Campbell. So he may have had a residence here. It's kind of apparent from some of his correspondence that he probably did not live here full time, but he could have at least stayed here as necessary. So through the end of the 18th century, the American army actually became a major customer of Robert Campbell's mill here at Mill Creek. From the time they arrived in 1796 through about 1800, there were just constant uh, construction projects going on over at Fort Mackinac to repair it and get it into good shape. And again, a lot of those materials would have come from the mill here. But it's important to remember that there was always more than just the sawmill here. Campbell had really diversified his operations into a variety of other things. And we know that thanks to uh, a land claim that was submitted in 1808. Now that's when Robert Campbell died and his son and daughter actually filed a claim with the American Land Office in Detroit and they had to list everything that they were claiming as their inheritance. It included not only the sawmill, but a grist mill, which is another type of mechanical mill for grinding uh, grain into flour. There were extensive orchards here. There were what they referred to as many valuable buildings. There were about 40 acres of cultivated farmland and the entire tract was about 640 acres. Now Campbell's heirs actually held on to this property for about another 10 years until they sold it in 1819 to a man named Michael Dousman. Dousman was a very prominent resident of Mackinac Island. He was a little bit infamous thanks to his role in the War of 1812. There were accusations that he had actually assisted the British when they came back in 1812 and successfully captured the island. Uh, so he was actually kind of an outcast on the island for a little while. Uh, he actually had to clear his name in court to prove that he was a loyal American citizen. But by 1819, uh, again, he is a very prominent island businessman. He buys this property and adds it to a growing business empire. He continued running the sawmill and through the 1820s and the 1830s, he regularly held contracts with the federal government to supply Fort Mackinac with sawn lumber, with shingles and other timber products that he was probably creating here at Mill Creek. But again, the mill is not all that's here. And in fact, Dousman really used this property as an agricultural center, much more so than for just the sawmill alone, because those same contracts that he's uh, drawing up with the U.S. Army uh, call for him to supply beef. There would have been a cattle herd here. Uh, they call for him to supply straw and hay and just firewood, so not even milled lumber. And again, every year he is signing massive contracts with the U.S. Army to supply them from this spot. Now, Dousman is a very successful businessman. He did not actually live here at Mill Creek. He may have come to visit occasionally to oversee the operations, but he would not have been living on site. Instead, his employees were living here. There were probably several houses scattered throughout this area. Uh, in fact, these mounds here behind me, our archeologists believe were somehow related to the farm outbuildings that would have been here at this point. And again, Dousman would have used this spot as an agricultural center. And keep in mind, Mill Creek is just one of his business ventures, especially into the 1830s, Dousman really diversified. Uh, he got into Great Lakes shipping. He got into commercial fishing. He actually invested in other saw and grist mills over in Wisconsin and in a few other places. Uh, and so he actually ends up being one of the wealthiest people over on Mackinac Island. He's one of the largest landholders over on Mackinac Island. And it all kind of begins thanks to his investment here at Mill Creek. The products that he's able to sell from this spot and produce at this spot really do kind of fund his rise uh, into a very prominent person over on Mackinac Island. 
So through the 1820s and the 1830s, the mill definitely still remains in operation here, at least the sawmill portions of it. Now, we don't know a whole lot about the grist mill that Robert Campbell had built at this site. It may have been physically located inside the same building as the sawmill, so it could use the same drivetrain, the same water wheels. But it appears that Dousman really did not operate that grist mill very much or even at all. He may have never run it after he purchased the site in 1819. But the sawmill itself does remain in operation. Uh, for instance, uh, in 1825, lumber milled here at Mill Creek was used to build the Mission House over on Mackinac Island. Uh, that was a boarding school for Native American children. Uh, and then in 1830, more lumber from Mill Creek was used to build the Mission Church, which was the church associated with that mission school. But again, Dousman primarily relied on this Mill Creek site as an agricultural center. He would have had a lot of employees living here, uh, probably a foreman or a millwright, perhaps a blacksmith, uh, and several other laborers living here to look after the large cattle herd that we know was here, to look after the orchards, and to look after the large farm fields where he would have been growing all of those things that he was selling, mostly to the army over on Mackinac Island. So through the 1830s and into the 1840s, Mill Creek really is an integral part of Michael Dousman's business holdings, but the sawmill itself probably became less and less important. Again, it's unclear if Dousman ever ran the grist mill that had been located here, built by Robert Campbell. So Dousman probably was not milling any grain here in that grist mill. And again, by the end of the 1830s into the 1840s, it's unclear if the sawmill itself is even running anymore. There wasn't as much demand, and there was also new mills being built in Sheboygan, about 10, 15 miles east of here that were a little bit more powerful. So the sawmill here at Mill Creek may have gone out of operation sometime around 1840. But again, that does not mean that all work stopped here. This was a very important agricultural center. And in fact, on the 1850 census, Dousman listed huge agricultural holdings. Many, many acres of cultivated land, lots of farm buildings, uh, lots of uh, cattle. And a lot of that may have been located here at Mill Creek. Now, Dousman died in 1854. And his family actually sold this property to the Wendell family, who would actually own it for about the next 50 years. The Wendells, in turn, then leased portions of the property out to smaller tenant farmers. But very quickly, it appears that nature reclaimed this site. By the 1860s, people still knew that there had been a mill here. There's actually accounts from fishermen coming up the stream here trying to uh, catch trout. And they came across the ruins of the dam. They could see where the mill had been located. But they also said that nature was very quickly reclaiming everything here. A little bit later on, in 1862, there are other developments that take place here at Mill Creek. There's actually a road built right through the center of the site, just upstream of the dam. Uh, the old Mackinac Road actually would have been uh, plotted right through here. And it's actually kind of the main path that you still walk around on the site today. So although the mill itself was probably gone, Mill Creek itself continued to evolve through the 19th century. Again, the old Mackinac Trail, that road was added out here in 1862. About 20 years later, the railroad passed through the site. They actually bridged the creek just downstream from where we're standing right now. And again, it's that railroad crew in 1881 who discovered John Annan's grave, giving us some of the earliest evidence for people working out here at Mill Creek. Now, as the 20th century dawned, a new industry came to Mill Creek, and that was limestone quarrying. A company in 1902 began digging into the hillsides, digging pits across the property, and harvesting that limestone for sale elsewhere. Uh, they did kind of change the landscape out here. Unfortunately, some of those quarrying operations may also have obliterated any remaining traces of the mill itself. So if there were any ruins left by that time, they may have gotten destroyed by those quarrying operations. But again, they kept quarrying limestone out here for about 20 years through the 1920s. Now, throughout that time period, there were still people renting out here. So there were still tenants living out here. A lot of their property, however, reverted to the state of Michigan in the 1930s. So with Mill Creek in state hands, not a whole lot actually happened here for a few years. 
That all began to change in the early 1970s. At that point, there were some amateur historians from Sheboygan who were very interested in the history of Mill Creek. They wanted to try and find some of the buildings, uh, and they were actually able to identify some of the millstones that would have been located in Robert Campbell's grist mill. That spurred a larger interest on the part of Mackinac State Historic Parks, and we started doing professional archaeology out here in the 1970s. That's been ongoing ever since. Now, the site opened to the public in 1984, and we've also reconstructed several of the historic buildings that would have existed out here in the 19th century. We obviously have the dam and the sawmill. We have a barn or workshop, and then we also have the Millwright's house, which is this building right here behind me. Uh, this was probably home to one of Michael Dousman's employees, and it probably also contained a blacksmith shop. Now that should just give you a sense of the scope of activities that would have been taking place here at Mill Creek throughout most of the 19th century and even back into the 18th century. It was always more than just the sawmill. Although that's a big part of it, there is a blacksmith shop here. There are orchards here. There is a cattle herd here. There are very large farm fields here. There's all sorts of agricultural products coming out of here from most of the 19th century. And all of those things, the agricultural products, the sawn lumber, most of that is being shipped right over to Mackinac Island. The island is very closely linked with Mill Creek. A lot of the buildings over there would have been constructed with lumber from Mill Creek. The people living over there would have relied on the farm here for a lot of their supplies. And so again, it's always more than just the mill. Even if you look into the 20th century when the mill is long gone, there are still things coming out of this site with that limestone quarry. So that's just a quick look at the history of Mill Creek, uh, all of the various things that have been taking place here. I hope you've enjoyed this tour and also hope to see you at historic Mill Creek Discovery Park sometime soon.